Hey, Dee, did you see that pledge thing at the end of our newsletter last week? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you brought my attention to it. Um, that was a total accident. Yeah, we don't want p- pledges from people. That was a new feature that Substack turned on. Basically, if you're free, like we are, they said, hey, why don't you get people on the hook? So if you ever want to charge, they'll suddenly get charged. And like, no way. That's not how we roll. No, if people want to, you know, do an affiliate link or something to do with the podcast, or if they want to give us a donation, they can do that through the podcast. But for the Substack newsletter, just we're going to turn that button off. I turned it off immediately when I saw it. Hit it, D. <laughs> Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Dean Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I garden on seven and a half acres out in the country. You sound tired when you say that seven and a half acres. I'm Carol Michael <laughs> from Indianapolis, Indiana. I have a suburban garden measured in square feet. It's about a third of an acre. We call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we really want you to love it too. Yes, we do. And we aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. But that's enough of who, what, when, where. Let's move on to this week's episode. Hello, Dee. Hey, Carol. How does your garden grow? It grows well. Thanks for waiting for me today. I had to go to Garden Club. Fun. That's fun. I worked on the reason I sounded tired wasn't so much the garden. It was the fact that I worked on my websites all afternoon in my eyes. Yeah, I can imagine. (laughs) So tell me, what's up? So microgreens for sure, they are doing very well. My little experiment with the micro pads, for sure, the basic salad mix that which germinates really quick, doing really well. Uh, Good. Tried cilantro, which takes a little bit longer. I do think you need to be sure to mist them every day so they don't dry out. Yeah, I think that's kind of true of my microgreens. I think I've given up for this year. So you've got an an Easter project. Yes. So I have been for the last, I don't know, eight or nine days, I've been improving my egg breaking skills so that I can crack open an egg just at the very top. Mm -hmm. And then... I put on my blog what I'm going to do. I'm making a little Easter project with those, which is going to be super cute, as they say, super cute. (laughs) But it is going to be super cute. I am not doing any kind of project. Well, I'll put a link on my, I'll put a link here to the blog so people can see what my super cute idea is. And in the meantime, I have crocuses coming up everywhere and flowering tea everywhere. I've never seen them this early, this many. It's incredible. It's because your weather's been so all over the place. I need to go look. I bet I have winter aconites, but I'll go look after this podcast. I can't find the winter aconites anywhere, but I've got snowdrops and crocuses galore. And the very first uh, little Iris is coming up. Iris, the little lady, Lady Beatrix Stanley. She Mm -hmm. has buds. I bet she's open if I go out there today. The reticulatas. Is that what you're talking about? She is a reticulated iris, but she's actually his histroides. Histroides. Oh, histro- histroides. Yeah, which I don't we've never gotten into what the differences between all that stuff is. But for regular little folk, short irises. Yeah, for regular folk, just little short irises that bloom early in the spring. How about your garden, D? Um, not much other than at a reader's request, I wrote a post about my seed starting station and posted that this week. I went around the house and moved all of the indoor plants out of Masha's reach. And I figured out how to write for the cats and gardens blog. I'm going to write about the fact that Masha wants to eat all the plants and started throwing up. She is very active. So it is easy for her to get to plants. So I had to put a bunch of them in my office to hide them from her. Oh my gosh. So the office is off limits to her. Yeah, I can close the door to the office. So that's a good thing. So there you go. That's what's happened in my garden. I also, I have not dealt with the scale. And in fact, well, I'll just talk about that at the end, what I'm going to do. Okay. Well, I'm going to do a quote and we'll get started on the first topic, which is about flowers, as it always is. Do what you can with what you have, where you are, Theodore Roosevelt. Our Theodore, he is a practical guy, isn't he? He is. And people will see a theme to this week's uh, quotes after a while. So flowers, a guide to cutting gardens. And so we thought we'd talk a little bit about cutting gardens. We haven't, I don't think we've ever talked about cutting gardens. We've talked about how you are doing a cutting garden. I don't necessarily have a traditional cutting garden, 
but it is something that more and more people are interested in. Mm -hmm. So because people like to cut flowers and bring them indoors. And so there are certain things that you want to look for in the flowers that you grow. That is true. Uh, One of them is um, scent. Although there are people with allergies and sensitivity to scent who might say, I would like a scentless flower to bring indoors. But most people do want a little bit of a scent. That's part of it. Yeah. I mean, I think when we talk about lilies, you know, some people really can't handle the scent of true lilies because it can be quite strong. And I'm talking about like oriental lilies, orient pets. Yeah. Um, Those are very strong. They can be really strong, but like roses, most, most of the time, that's not too bad. Um, Bill doesn't like the scent of lilacs, interestingly enough. Interesting, because most people love the scent of lilacs. Hyacinths, mm-hmm. as we know, is another scent that if you have too many blooming hyacinths, hyacinths in your house, uh, it could force you to open the doors and windows on a cold winter day. And set those babies outside. <laughs> um, so the other thing we talked about is lack of pollen. Although we often talk about seeds and looking for seeds that have pollen, like sunflower seeds, because mm-hmm. that helps the bees and all the other little insects that have pollen. It does not look too good on your tabletop. And so a lot of people will look for seeds that don't have pollen. And one that comes to mind immediately is the ProCut series from... Um, well, I don't know who made the ProCut series, but ProCut series sunflowers do not have pollen. Well, and or if a flower has pollen, like lilies do, as soon as they open up, you just nip those things right off of there and throw them out. In fact, if you get lilies in bloom, somebody should have done that already, but they don't always. And then when they open up, you got to do it because it'll stain a tablecloth. It will. It will. Um, but, you know, in in my case, I, I just grow the sunflowers and bring them in and don't worry about it. Strong stems. Strong stems are important because you want, that's also a lot of times floral varieties have long stems. Yes. So you have have opportunity to cut them back, to put them in a vase, but having strong stems is important too. You also want a variety of flowers because um, if you're going to have a cutting garden, you don't want all your flowers ready to be cut like the third week of July and and then you don't have anything after that. So early spring, mid spring, late spring, early summer, mid summer, late summer, early fall, late summer, mid fall. Mm-hmm. And I would also advise you to deadhead. Um, if you deadhead certain annuals, you'll get flowers all summer. Zinnias come to mind, right. for example. Yeah. Um, and you also want ones that are fast growing. Again, Several flowers are very fast growing. Zinnias are one of them. Um, and I'll think of some others. I mean, Nicotiana can be, um, it, but it takes a little while. But once you start to, once it gets going, if you keep snipping it back, um, you'll have flowers all summer long. Yeah. Now, sweet peas, you won't have some flowers all summer long, but if you start cutting back, they'll produce a few more. You can extend right. the life of those. You can, and you can also make them branch better by pinching them off down at the bottom when they're just barely, you know, three inches tall. That's a good time to pinch them back. And then you get many more branches of the sweet peas. Something I didn't know for a long time until I watched Monty Don, because nobody in Oklahoma really grows sweet peas. For Um, obvious reasons. Because it's hot. And I'm getting ready to go out there and sow some sweet peas, and we'll see what happens. You want them to also be long-lasting in a vase. And one of the ways that you can make flowers last even longer is to, every couple of days, cut off the stems again so that they suck up water again. And change the water. And change the water because the water is disgusting. Do you yeah. do that, D? Yeah, that... actually, I do. Okay, mm-hmm. I do sometimes, and then sometimes I forget, and I'm thinking, oh, those are flowers are drying out, and they're not in any water at all. It's all evaporated. <laughs> I also cut off the stems at the bottom on an angle so that they last long, you know, because then that way only the tip of the stem hits the bottom of the vase, and so that 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 cut edge does not get uh, sealed off by accident. So those are our bits of advice about. We have one more piece to grow. We We have one more piece of advice. We do. Where is it? Daffodils belong alone. There's no. (laughs) Yeah, they don't like, they don't like other flowers and they have that nasty, sticky stuff that can clog up other flowers um, so that they can't drop water. 
And really, I would think like Amsonia, and there's some other flowers, which Amsonia probably doesn't last terribly long in a vase. I wouldn't think so. But any any flower that has a sticky sap that comes out of it, it's probably not going to play well with other flowers. Right. And it also may not do well. You want really clean stems. So I wonder if Nicotiana would even be a good um, cut flower. I know people put it in there sometimes. You can also use seeds like amaranth and celosia. Those um, do well as fillers in bouquets, as does Bells of Ireland. There's a lot of different ones that are fillers. There are. Um, what made us think of this, partly, was the Nostalgia Garden by National Garden Bureau. And we will link to that, but they have a very nice article about growing a Nostalgia Garden. And for many people, cut flowers are nostalgic because uh, a there might be the scent. Or it might be that was the flower for a special occasions at their house, you know, that somebody bought or brought in for special occasions. And so we do wax nostalgic about some of these cut flowers. Yes. And some of the ones that they mention on here, just to give people an idea, of course, they mention, mention roses and especially scented roses. And then they talk about uh, lilacs, which, of course, we love lilacs. Yes. Except my husband. Then they talk about hydrangeas, and they give some ideas about different hydrangeas. Hydrangeas make great cut flowers. Uh, Lavender, also really good cut flower. Lasts a long time in a vase. And then they brought up um, tall garden flocks, which I did not think about. But, yes, of course, it's good. It's a long-lasting Yeah, it would be great. It's an old fashioned yeah. flower too. So yeah. So great nostalgic flowers that you could cut and bring inside, which people grow things for, you know, good reasons. Um, and then we talked about also in our notes, we, we said you can, you know, generally people think of cut flowers as being annuals, but not necessarily because phlox, for example, is a perennial phlox paniculata, um, but yep. also peonies. I love yeah. peonies in a vase. Peonies are great. We should link. Did you do a post about that time that you saved the peonies for the rehearsal dinner? I can't remember. You know, if I didn't, I sure should have. And I yeah. I will go back and look. But I did. Um, and people wonder. I'll just explain really quickly how I did that. So you have to cut the peony when the bud is about the size and consistency of a large marshmallow. Mm-hmm. And then you wrap it up in plastic wrap Mm -hmm. and then wrap that in like a newspaper and shove it in the back of the refrigerator and forget about it until in my case, I took them out in July when my sister wanted them for a rehearsal dinner. And within 24 hours, they, they were in full bloom when I stuck them in a vase. I mean, I recut the bottoms Mm -hmm. and um, she, they really liked it. She really, she, she had enough to put one in a little short vase on each table, but it was kind of fun in July where you don't normally expect peonies unless you live in Alaska or something where they're that late. But, you know, <laughs> you can do stuff like that. It was fun. Yeah, and that was a cool thing you did. Um, also, we thought we would link to Vegetables Love Flowers, which is a book by Lisa Ziegler, who we know, and um, she knows a lot about cut flower gardens. And this is also a companion plant book. And I think we reviewed it on here, if I'm remembering right. Probably did. And and then she also has a podcast um, and her podcast is called Field and Garden. So she's a good a good resource for cut flower gardens. Yeah, because she grows them for fun and profit, as they say. Yes, she does. Might be just for profit now. Mm-hmm. All so right. You want me to do this one? I do because I think we've exhausted what we wanted to say about cut flowers. Other yes. than um you, every gardener should have some. That's all I'm gonna say. Yes. If you live in Oklahoma, you should grow zinnias. I, I'm gonna bring up one thing about zinnias. So there there's a um an Instagrammer on, and I can't think of her name right now, but she's a flower farmer, and she has been trying to raise money for her flower farm. And yeah. instead of selling, a lot of people do CSA flower bouquets for the spring and summer. I've seen that done. This lady is selling, she does specialty zinnias. Remember Sunflower Steve who does specialty sunflowers? Yeah. Well, she does specialty zinnias. And I was pretty tempted. She sold just a few of a mix she has. And now she has one that's being auctioned off that I saw on Instagram this morning. It was up to $200 for 30 seeds. I said, no, thank you. 
No, thank you. Yeah, we're crazy, but we're not that not crazy. That crazy. Mm-hmm. Well, some people might say we are that crazy. Do that next quote, D, before people debate that. <laughs> No occupation is so delightful to me as the culture of the earth. No culture comparable to that of the garden. But though an old man, I am but a young gardener. Thomas Jefferson. I see what you're doing here. You see what I'm doing here. Well, we won't tell our listeners until after the next quote. (laughs) So vegetables. We are talking about a friend of ours, a friend and colleague. and. I thought that this was going to be under dirt, but we decided to do it under vegetables. That was well, we're kind of sort of like it's about heirloom vegetables. And when you think heirloom uh-huh. vegetables, you immediately think of the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. And then and you immediately think of Ira Wallace. Lovely, so the New lovely York lady. Times, oh, my gosh. Ira is one of the finest people I've ever known. No, no one is more generous. Um, Ira was this was featured in the New York Times and we have a gift link for our listeners because I'm a subscriber and um it's a feature on Ira and um I was deeply touched by it because Ira deserves all the due she gets all the recognition yes I love the title she, yeah I do too you can read it they call her the godmother of southern seeds for a reason cuz she is she she is she is she has brought more attention to Southern heirloom vegetables than anybody I know. And um, she has worked really hard about it, including working on something that is called, let me make sure I get this right. It is called the Heirloom Collard Project. And the group, a different group of um, seed companies have worked really hard to keep different types of collards in production and have seeds for them. And she was the person who spearheaded that. And the groups are the Seed Savers Exchange, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, Ujama, and the Utopian Seed Project. And so they want people to grow collards, which grow really well in Southern states, better than most greens do. And I like collards. I actually eat them quite often. So um, I think it's pretty amazing. But she's done a lot of other stuff, too. She started a heritage festival that I don't know if it's still going on, um, but it was a great festival that ran for quite a while at Monticello because she lives in Virginia on the Acorn community. She's a member of the Acorn community, and they're an egalitarian cooperative community in central Virginia, and they're the people who own Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. I love the their motto. It's saving the past for the future. I like that. I love that too. Um, do you want to talk about all the books that Ira has written? Yeah, I went onto the website and there were several books on vegetable gardening that Timber Press has put out and they're called the Grow Great Vegetable Series. Mm-hmm. And Ira has Grow Great Vegetables, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Tennessee. You cannot mm-hmm. grow vegetables in the South without learning something from Ira. And, mm-hmm. and so it reminded me, Timber Press put out a book and they sent me a copy. It's Grow Great Vegetables, Indiana, et- edited by Bevan Cohen. And mm-hmm. it's coming out in April of 2023. And at first I thought, why do why do you need a book about growing vegetables just for your state? And I think it's it's a good selling point. It is because a lot of times, you know, I could pick up a book for Illinois, Ohio, Indiana, mm-hmm. and feel fairly confident that the information is for my region, but Mm -hmm. you get down into Kentucky, it's a lot warmer. You get up into Michigan, it's a lot colder. And so it does make sense, especially for newer gardeners to be able to pick up the book and know with confidence, okay, the stuff in this book is for my state. I can, I don't have to do a cult, um, a climate translation. This is okay. If they do this, then in North Carolina, you know, like you and I, we, we don't garden things at the same time. No, we don't. And even Oklahoma and Texas or Oklahoma and Kansas are different. And even though I have followers in Texas, mostly in Northern Texas, it's, you know, it's complicated to grow for your state. And so I think it's smart. And I think it's a really interesting way to um, get people to buy the books. It makes it easy for the reader. Yeah. Now there is a book for Texas and I'm thinking that's got to cut, that covers a pretty big state. 
Well, Texas is really complicated. I think Oklahoma is complicated. I just wrote an article for Oklahoma Living about how hard it is to grow in Oklahoma. And then I got a couple of speaking engagements because of it, um, because it is hard to grow here. It's very different from Western Oklahoma than Northeastern Oklahoma. Altus is in the Southwest and, you know, Tulsa is in the Northeast and they have totally different conditions. Can you imagine for Texas? I can imagine. Now, interestingly enough, they have Grow Great Vegetables Texas. Right. So I'm assuming they've addressed those differences. They did not have one for Oklahoma. I'm, and I don't know if they're going to come out with one eventually or just what their yeah, plans yeah. are. But the Usually Indi- they overlook Oklahoma, but go ahead. Oh, what yeah. But the Indiana one's coming out in April. So I have a I have a copy of it. And, um, you know, it's a, re- a review copy. I, I don't know. No, it's the actual copy. But maybe maybe when April comes around, if somebody reminds me, maybe we should give that as a giveaway because I don't I don't necessarily need another book on growing vegetables. But that would be a good one to gift to somebody who's just getting growing in Indiana or Ohio right. or Illinois. Right. So you want to do that's all we're going to talk about for vegetables this week. Yeah, but I do. I do think heirloom vegetables are important. And I have hats off to all the, the Seed Savers Exchange and the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange for keeping keeping these heirlooms going and keeping them in commerce, so to speak. Well, when I wrote my book, um, I I actually profiled Southern Exposure Seed Exchange because I have bought a lot of seeds from them over the years and they do better for me than, say, buying from a national company because they save them and they grow them in their area. So, so that's oh, a good tip want... for somebody that's in a warm climate and they're just like, I'm just not doing well. Go to the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and buy some seeds from them and I, I bet you do better. I think you will too. I really do. And let me say one more thing about Ira. I met her on a blogging um, expedition that we did Uh a while back. And I don't even remember where we were, but we sat on the bus together or near each other. And I had no idea who she was because she's so humble that she doesn't really tell you until you get to know her better. And then she mentions it and you're like, holy moly, you're the Ira. Wallace. Yeah. 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 She's a lovely lady. We are she privileged is. to know her. We are. I'm going to do a quote. Go for it. Every expert was once a beginner. Rutherford B. Hayes. <laughs> so so because what holiday are we close to? <laughs> we're close to President's Day. And I thought, you know, sometimes sometimes if you have a theme, when you go after quotes, you can find something a little bit different. I thought we're going to do President's. Oh, and we should tell people we don't keep these quotes. I mean, they're in our notes, but we don't keep them really anywhere. And there's no, no organization. So not too long ago, somebody said, hey, can you get me notes on, se- you know, quotes on seeds? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I mean, those will be hard to find. So no, they're just, in the, yeah, we'd have to go back and say, did we? Yeah, no, we don't. We just but prepare anyway. them each week. We don't even think about it is the point. That's All true. right. Our book on the bookshelf this week is The Container Victory Garden, A Beginner's Guide to Growing Your Own Groceries by Maggie, and I assume it's Stucky. And we have links to it. And um, th- we were sent this book and we were sent it from the imprint is the Celebrate imprint, which I think is Harper. Isn't yeah, it? it's Harper Celebrate. And yeah. this book came out in 2022. And the interesting thing the author Maggie Stuckey did that I thought was interesting is she, she kind of tells the story of victory gardens. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she talks about world war one and the Spanish flu pandemic and the victory gardens around world war one, when everybody was encouraged to grow food. And then, mm-hmm. you know, it happens again, world war two comes along. And again, everybody is encouraged to plant a victory garden because we need more food grown on the home front. Um, and so, it is about growing vegetables in containers, which is nice for people who don't have very much space or just don't want to dig up the back 40, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And she's got all kinds of information that would be helpful if that is what you are trying to do. Again, it is a beginner book. So if you're an experienced uh, container gardener person, you probably would want to buy this as a gift to somebody who is not as experienced and maybe is asking you a thousand and one questions. Here, here's a book. You know what? This is really, I think this would be really good 
to put in a basket for a wedding gift with some tools. I think this would be one of those great ones. It's it's actually what I used to suggest my book for. I guess I still do because my book is still out there. So same idea, brand new people gardening book. Yeah, is or if somebody is, is with, with some history. Somebody is moving out of their parents' home and even into an apartment or a condo. Right. And they're going to grow in containers. The, again, you could put this in there, add a smart pot, uh, or actually make it the smart pot, the basket. Put this in there and put a few mm-hmm. little tools and maybe a gift certificate to the local garden center to get them started. That would be a that'd be great nice gift. And that'd if people like gift. history, she's interspersed in here some recollections of people that remember Victory Gardens from back in World War II. So that I bet that, she came up. I bet she came up with the idea because of COVID, because gardening got to be so popular during. The she pandemic. did, and and she kind of mentions COVID as like the the next phase in our history where people, um, I don't know that we came out and said, hey, plant victory gardens, but people came out and said, hey, can we plant, you know, plant gardens because people wanted to put gardens in the, um, they didn't have anything else to do. So might as well plant a garden. Exactly. That's a good approach. What a very good go. approach. And so, I love growing things in containers. I can tell you that as someone who has downsized, um, because there's only two of us eating now at home, except for when the kids come to visit, growing in containers is a great idea. It is a great idea. So that is The Container Victory Garden, A Beginner's Guide to Growing Your Own Groceries by Maggie Stuckey. Our book I'll for this week. Quote. Go for it. I believe you can, and you're halfway there. Theodore Roosevelt. Another presidential quote. It threw me for a second because I had done another Theodore Roosevelt. And I thought, wait a minute, am I in the right spot in the notes? Because sometimes <laughs> we move around. So our dirt is um, about President's Day. And we decided that one of the things that was really good for dirt is all the president's gardens, Madison's cabbages to Kennedy's roses, how the White House gar- gar- grounds have grown with America. Marta McDowell wrote that, and Marta McDowell writes great books. She does. That tie. She just has found her niche and it is tying like history or location or author, and then she puts it into gardening. And it is that is a fun, fun book. Yes, it's a good one to pull off the shelf in February and have a look-see. And because even if you've read it before, you're going to see something new or just, you know, flip to a chapter that is interesting to you and and just enjoy it. Yeah, it's a good book. All right, I'm going to do the next quote. A little flattery will support a man through great fatigue. James Monroe. <laughs> Well, I guess now we could say a little good self-talk would, you know, help you through a time of fatigue. That's funny. yeah. Yeah. Or like so if we our, could just do this for 15 more minutes, we could probably get over the hump. Probably. So we were going to talk about rabbit holes and you told me to buy a book. Well, I mean, you suggested that I might buy a book called Seasons of Wonder, which is a really cool devotion. It's kind of a little devotional. And, yes. but, but it's set up week by week and it has a lot to do with gardening. And she takes like the things of nature and then she ties it into it being God's gift, but also projects. And I think she is Episcopalian, or at least she was raised Episcopalian. And I enjoyed the book very much. I think the book would be great for um, moms who are homeschooling and they would have little projects for their kids. Or young moms everywhere, because in the book, I actually have done some of these um, projects that she suggests. And Carol's cool. looking at the book right now. I am. So pull up a week because my book is in my living room. So, so if I pull up a week and so uh, week six is embark on a pilgrimage. And so she always has like a little piece of a poem or something. And so she has on there, uh, take a Lenten pilgrimage together. You could go to a place like a city park that is completely new to everyone or explore a friend's backyard. Um, and you sort of keep it simple, you know, take a bottle, take a map, take a snack, 
take a water bottle. I shouldn't say like take a bottle like vodka, a water bottle. <laughs> Not vodka. And just um, enjoy but- it. Yeah. Take a walk and have a little snack because any mother who has little kids has little snacks in their car. Yeah. Um, And often water. And then on, you know, like I think about like when you go out in the garden with the little magnifying glasses to look at bugs, you know, those little kits that you can buy. Yes. That could be a pilgrimage according to how this lady thinks about it. In another place, I think she has you make pretzels. Or she has you make hot cross buns, which I did both of those during my raising of my kids. I think those, the reason that she's saying do this is she's talking about ritual, routine, and first time experiences. And the more experiences you have with um, family and friends, the more you build up those rituals. And she's talking about the fact that in our society, we don't have as much ritual as we used to. I thought it was very enjoyable. I'm actually going to give it to a friend and have her give it to her daughter because I think she would like it. Very good. And it kind of ties in this whole idea of rituals versus routines versus first time experiences. Mm -hmm. You and uh, one of our listeners, I think it's Angela said, talked about Dandelion Wine by Ray Bradbury. And I'm yeah. I'm slowly making my way through the uh, audio book of that. And they he talked about that a little bit. He so. does. And in fact, um, Dandelion Wine is part of a three book series. And one of them is Something Wicked This Way Comes, which is that's one of the three book series. Dandelion Wine is either the second or the third. And right now I can't remember off the top of my head what the other one is, but I it might be Green Gage Summer. But I'm just pulling that out of nowhere. So I could be making yeah, I don't know. Uh, Ray Bradbury is one of my all-time favorite authors. And if you ever get a chance to see him talk about writing on YouTube, it is worth watching. Because he was one of the most generous writers out there. He told Good all deal. about his prices and stuff. Good so deal. what is your, what is your, see, that was quite the rabbit hole. What was your rabbit hole this time? So speaking of, speaking of YouTube, so YouTube now thinks that I'm a full-fledged cross-stitcher because all the videos it suggests are something called <laughs> floss tube and literally two women, or sometimes it's just one person will sit there for an hour and talk about their works in progress, their finished pieces, show charts. It's, it's kind of charming, but you know. So I have gotten into the cross stitch still, and it's, I got my old cross stitch books out and like, oh, and this is funny. I was looking at cross stitch magazine last night. I thought I have, I have stitched this chart and it was real cute with like these three bunnies. And it's like, I know I've stitched this chart and I'm thinking, where is it? Where is it? It's not here in the house. So I flipped the page. And there's my my one niece, her name and date of birth and weight. And it's like, I made a birth sampler for my niece. You did? I, make, I got to make sure my older sister still has that because it's like, that is a really, because I thought, I know I've done this. If I hadn't done it, I wanted to. Anyway, so <laughs> I went down that rabbit hole and then, you know, cataloging all my books and I... I have gotten to where I'm in this room where I'm in now, my den. And if you look over this shoulder over here, those those yes. three those three shelves have been done. Good for you. And there's a big pile of books to give away. And I, in the other room where all the gardening books are, I've done everything except the shelves that have all the books that are really really old. They have no ISBN number, so you have to hand enter each one. And there are so many. It's like I need to that pull them all off. Time. Yeah figure out which ones I'm going to keep those. I'm going to recatalog the rest. I, I don't know where, I, I don't know where to send them. Cause you I can't, don't know where to tell you if you take them to half price books, I think they'll end up in recycle. I think so. I, I, I got to think about it, but anyway, that's, I'm into those projects. I'm into other things that I'm not prepared to talk about yet, but we'll see. You're busy. Okay. So I need to correct something. What is that uh, that you need to correct? Green Gage Summer was written by Rumor Godden, which okay, so oops. that's not that's not Ray but Bradbury. Dandelion Wine, of course, written by Ray Bradbury. Something Wicked This Way Comes, which is the second novel, and the other one is Farewell Summer. That's what ah, I said. Okay, so just just making sure that I'm not giving false information to our listeners. We would never want to do that. Let's talk about our garden commissions. 
Okay. Garden commissions. Um, mine. Okay. So everybody's going to be really sad when I tell this garden commission, but I've dreamed about it three times. So it needs to happen. Okay. I'm getting rid of my orange tree. I'm getting rid of my orange tree. I'm getting rid of all of my citrus, except the Meyer lemon tree. And the reason is I have yet to get, well, okay. So I've gotten oranges on the orange tree a couple of times, the lime tree and the other one. Oh, well, I'm going to keep my variegated lemon too, because I think it's a pretty tree. So okay. So we've gone two. to, I'm getting rid of all of them too. Well, I'm keeping the no, Meyer lemon. All. Now I'm keeping the variegated lemon. You have gotten some oranges off the orange trees. Can we talk you into keeping that? No, that tree is huge and it gets sick every year. So it is going on the compost pile. And so is the lime tree. I will keep two citrus trees because that's all I can, that's all I can deal with. Can you do me a favor? With the citrus scale. What? Plant them in the garden and see how long they last. No, they don't go with my style. No, I will not do that. <laughs> so that's my garden commission is I'm going to do that. And I'm also going to uh, plant my sweet peas. It is okay to downsize the number of plants that I own. I, I, I'm in total agreement. I'm in total agreement. So it is going to be a lovely week here. Wednesday's like 65 and sunny in February. It's like, what? I, I'm, like, no, I'm wrapping my beautiful. brain around it. So I will do some garden cleanup. I've done that a little bit already. Uh, I am actually going to start some seeds for, I think, onions, lavender for sure. And we'll see about some others. And because it's been so warm, I really kind of think the greenhouse is going to call me any day and say, violas and pansies, we can't hold them back. And then I'll, I don't think it'll be in the next week, but I, I imagine it'll be pretty early this year. So I have a question. What lavender are you growing from seed? Do you know the variety? I do. I'm growing just plain. It's just labeled English lavender, and I'm lay. And the other one is just labeled the Lady Lavender. And Lady Lavender is supposed to be one that will bloom the first year from seed. Yeah, I suspect English lavender will not. No, probably not. If you can get it to grow, Um, I think that's interesting. Why? Why did you buy those? Because. I have to write a family handyman article about growing those things oh. from seed and I need to take some pictures. So that's why oh, I'm like, okay. oh, now I understand. Yes. Now it's you like, understand. This doesn't sound like you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's wrap it up. All right. Well, thank you for listening to the Garden Angelus. I hope you've hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. We publish every week on Wednesdays at 12 a.m. Eastern time. And if you listen to Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review. That helps us get noticed by others. Could you also share our podcast with your friends? Word of mouth is still the best way to get the word out there. And be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. And subscribe to our Substack newsletter, The Garden Angelus at substack.com, also linked to in our show notes. And by the way, you do not have to pay for it. Not at all. And please do not pledge anything. If you want to help support us, use those affiliate links. If you buy something after clicking through on them, we're in a small commission and it costs you nothing. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the Golden Gate. Bye until next week. Bye, everybody.